So I'm going to talk about three miracles. And the first miracle was yesterday. Scotland. Andy Murray. Now, I better not wear it the whole time or the cameras will be uh, not seeing my face, which might not be a bad thing. So we'll just sit that there. So that was the first miracle. The second miracle, actually, I should say, where, where's uh, Mikel? Mikel Clare. There he is. He said to me, uh, yeah, he says, I, I feel really pleased for the English. <laughs> what? He says, he's Scottish. And I said, you should ple feel pleased for the English because in two years' time, they'd still be waiting. It'd be 79 years. <laughs> That's an inside joke because Scotland will be independent in two years' time. Um, the second miracle, I don't know if any of you have been to your room yet. Uh, the second miracle is that here they've managed to make a bathroom smaller than an airplane's bathroom. <laughs> And put a shower in it. It's unbelievable. And, and the, third, the third one is this, uh, this miracle. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I want to start with a quote from a serious scientist, Jack Nicholson. In my last year of school, I was voted class optimist and class pessimist. That's uh, Jack Nicholson, in case you don't know who he was. Looking back, I realized I was only half right. Um, and uh, so there's a story to be told here. And this is uh, way back when pneumonia, tuberculosis, diarrhea, diphtheria caused one-third of deaths on this planet. And Staph aureus was fatal in 80% of infected wounds. And Alexander Fleming, who probably was Scottish, I'm sure he or a Scottish auntie, <laughs> was a bacteriologist not so far from here at St. Mary's, and he found a mold discarded culture. And the rest is history. In the 40s and 50s, it's commercial, viable, large-scale uh, manufacturing of penicillin. And then uh, others followed until there's 150 different varieties of antibiotics available. However, Fleming was quoted in the New York Times in 1945. The greatest possibility of evil in self-medication is the use of two small doses so that instead of clearing up infection, the microbes are educated to resist penicillin and a host of penicillin fast organisms is bred out which can be passed to other individuals and from them to others until they reach someone who gets a septicemia or pneumonia which penicillin cannot save. So 1945, he gave us a warning. That's a long time ago. Did we get mixed up with this Fleming and the other one? A view to a kill. It's all about killing, isn't it? Killing, we love to kill. So these are the, the drug classes signed from 1935. Last one you see is a long time ago. And uh, the development pipeline of antibiotics has dried up. And for the least next 10 years, there's no new antibiotic classes coming to market. That's pretty scary thought. It was an Australian with Scottish grandparents, uh, Howard Florey <laughs> and colleagues in the 1940s, he changed the course of history, developed large-scale penicillin production and it won him a Nobel Prize, and it's estimated to have saved 80 million lives. I don't know how you count that, but lots and lots of lives. Penicillin is considered one of the top 10 greatest medical discoveries, so it really is a miracle. Number of side, uh, lives saved by antibiotics is immeasurable. If you're septic in the intensive care unit, you'll be the world's leading proponent of antibiotics. No question about that. But now the rest of the story. Otherwise, you wouldn't have asked me to talk about this. So is there a correlation between, you've seen these slides before, the rheumatic fever, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and these other chronic diseases, and these are when the antibiotics were introduced. Um, I thought it was kind of neat that, I don't know if there's a correlation. Probably I could put up the number of televisions sold, and it could probably show a correlation. But it made me wonder uh, um, what, this might, what role this might play given what we now know about antibiotics. Uh, were we just stupid back then? Um, well, this is what we did think back then. Uh, camel cigarettes for steady pleasure. Um, <laughs> camels win with me every time they're easy on my throat. I don't know if she died of throat cancer, but anyway. And then smart girls, only smart girls. So any smart girls out there? That's what we thought of cigarettes. Uh, now we don't think of that so much. Um, we think of cigarettes, uh, you might as well uh, take them. So thank goodness we pay attention to th authorities on the topic. And this is from the Center of Disease Control. Antibiotics aren't always the answer. 
Whew, thank goodness for that. Someone's finally seeing the sense of it. Or are they? Um, well, antibiotics do kill, and they kill 80,000 Chinese people a year. Interesting, eh? 80,000 Chinese people. This is another one, uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, 150,000 deaths. This is the WHO. So they are killing. They're killing people. Uh, azithromycin, the risk of cardiovascular disease. So we'll, we'll cure your infection and you'll die of a heart attack. Uh, suggests this may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So we're sort of learning a lot about these antibiotics that we didn't think of so much. Um, so we've learned not to use them so much, right? Well, here's uh, the Dutch. There's a few Dutch in the audience. The Dutch, they're doing the right thing, aren't they? Uh, actually, they're not. The rate of antibiotic prescribing for patients made a visit to GP is increasing in the Netherlands, the most evident increase in elderly patients, increasing. This is interesting, the Cleveland Clinic, we believe that, that the available evidence does not support routine antibiotic prophylaxis for dental procedures in patients who have undergone total joint replacement, even though the practice is very common, even though professional societies recommend it. Are you kind of looking at this thing, what are we doing? What are we doing? Every year in England, over 40 million courses of antibiotics are used. According to CDC, 18 million courses are prescribed by doctors. Well, that's amazing, eh? For the common cold in the US, 50 million unnecessary antibiotics for viral respiratory infections in the US. That's over 30, 235 million doses of antibiotics are consumed by Americans. That's a lot of food. A lot of food. So this is a nice uh, paper that uh, Martin Blazer presented a couple of weeks ago. This is uh, from, based on a New England Journal of Medicine paper. This is your age, so the chances are you're age zero to one. You've already had 2.73 prescriptions of antibiotics. By the time you get to 64, you've had fi about 51 prescriptions of antibiotics. That's an awful lot of antibiotics. 51 courses of antibiotics. I mean, I could say hands up here who hasn't had antibiotics. This is a correlation in geography and obesity. So this is uh, sadly obesity in the US, and this is antibiotic prescriptions per 1,000 persons. So I mean, this is, it just can't be coincidence. There must be something going on that we just have taken for granted. We don't understand, maybe. So we're not making people fat enough, so let's give them more antibiotics. Well, this is a, just came out, malnourished gain life saver in antibiotics. So this is a paper from Washington University in St. Louis, and it said that, uh, well, uh, talks about various things, therapeutic foods, but it says, this is ready for prime time. So if you have a malnourished kid, give them antibiotics. Hello? Well, in the same journal, Stopping the Madness, this is from uh, a group that are with antibiotics, uh, basically antibiotics, careful use of them. And they said in the paper, the differential in the rate of treatment failure between the antibiotic treatment groups and the placebo group was less than 1%. But the media and everyone else picked up and said, if you're malnourished, give the kid antibiotics. And they said that we should be looking at other things, including the use of breastfeeding and probiotics. Breastfeeding for malnourishment. Oh, hello, that's a new idea. Same journal. Well, if we are what we eat and drink, that makes us drugs, which I'm disappointed because I always say that we are bacteria because we have more bacteria than human cells, but we're not, we're really drugs. Because 41 million Americans drink water contaminated with antibiotics, anticonvulsants, mood stabilizers, and sex, sex hormones, that is. Well, so here's, here's uh, Philadelphia. They tested, they found 56 pharmaceuticals in the drinking water. 56, <laughs> love it, eh? Um, comes in the 63 pharmaceuticals in the city's watershed. 18.5 million in people in Southern California are drinking anti-epileptic and anti-anxiety medications. Who's from California here? <laughs> You're the people that are shaking. Um, or you can go to New Jersey and have some angina medicine. <laughs> Sex hormone, that's the place to be, San Francisco. Uh, it's pretty crazy, yeah? 
Um, this is another report, consumer health uh, information, and th this is what they found in the, the nation's water, antibiotics, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, prescription hormones, blood medication, cholesterols. We're giving up chemicals like uh, there's no tomorrow. So, yeah, don't exaggerate, antibiotics are good for us. So I, I gotta, be, gotta make sure I give a balanced talk because this has been filmed, right? My mommy will see it. Well, they're actually implicated in 20% of all drug-related emergency department visits. That's one in five. Which ones? So here's the number of cases annual estimates of drug most commonly implicated in adverse events in emergency departments. This is US 2004-5. Might have changed a bit now, but you see insulins and warfarin is right up there. Amoxicillin, etc. right down the list. We have people in Canada who are talking about individualized medicine. And for them, personalized medicine, the real key breakthrough is now we can tell you which level of warfarin to give you. Well, that's great. But you've forgotten everything else and not even talk about the microbiome. So individualized medicine shouldn't just be about which deadly drug to give and which level. Penicillin, cephalosporin is the highest allergic reaction of any other drug. One in 5,000 exposures of penicillin can lead to anaphylactic shock. Well, that's okay as long as you're not the one in 5,000. So where have all these antibiotics coming from? Well, humans are not the only ones to benefit from them. Antibiotics are routinely used in the feed of healthy farm animals because it makes them grow faster and fatter. I love this. There we go. CAFO. Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. I don't know if you've, I've never, never been here, but I'd like to see it. These are what the cows, that's their life. And this looks out of focus, but it isn't. There's a plastic mesh here, so it makes it look out of focus. These are the chickens that you might be having for lunch. So feeding 312 Americans, what do you do? Uh, meat and poultry industry is the largest segment of US agriculture. 93 billion pounds of meat a year. So here's some, most of that 8.6 billion chickens. There's cattle, turkey, lamb, hogs. All right, so we have to eat, but do we have to give them antibiotics? Well, China's number one. It surprised me a little bit. I would assume this is mostly because of chickens, but that's 53,747,000 7, metric tons. So why do CAFO owners use so many antibiotics? Well, first of all, they have crowding. So they create a crowding condition, and then they put the animal under stress. It makes them aggressive and sick. OK. So they use sub-therapeutic doses of antibiotics to prevent disease in the stressful setting that they have just given them. And 80% of the antibiotics in this country, America, go to treat. They're not treating the animals. They're treating them so they get fat. And what do they produce? Toxic feces. <laughs> All right. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, CAFO produces 65% of US manure, or about 300 million tons a year. That's double the amount of poo generated by all the people in the US. <laughs> and what's in it? Antibiotics. So resistant bacteria, as we know, can be transferred to the human population. This is CDC. 76 million cases of foodborne illness, Campylobacter salmonella, 5,000 deaths from viral and bacterial pathogens. One of the drugs, Virginia mycin, this is a drug of last resort, Synersid. This is Virginia mycin, is used as a growth promoter in chickens and pigs in the US. When is a Holstein cow not a Holstein cow? Well, here's an article on it. This drug, Zilmax, was called uh, Zilpatero, was used to treat asthma in humans. The drug was absolute failure. So the World Anti-Doping Agency banned the drug for human consumption. So what did Merck do? They gave it to animals. This animal right here doesn't look like a Holstein anymore, because it's not a Holstein anymore. We're giving drugs banned for human to animals. Here's a recent outbreak in this, uh, December 2012. Here's Kentucky Fried Chicken, you may have heard this. The Chinese reported in some poultry farms they'd given chickens excess amount of antibiotics to survive in overcrowded chicken houses. 
And these chickens were used for Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's in other parts of the world. All right, vegetarians. Hands up who's a vegetarian. Vegetarians, so you think you're, you're safe. Well, you're not. Sorry, I'm going to wreck your day. Because what do you use? Well, 90% of these drugs administered to animals end up being excreted as urine or manure. And guess what? The manure is then used to grow the crops that you eat as vegetarians. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So the FDA releases the amount of antibiotics used in a factory farmed livestock, and it's a ton. So this is reports said. 2009, 29 million pounds of antibiotics given to our nation's livestock. 29 million pounds. That's, that's half of Robin Van Persie, isn't it? That's, um, one farm more pollution than all of Houston, Texas. So this single farm raising 140,000 head of cattle produces 1.6 million tons of manure every year, more than produced by the whole of Houston, Texas. One farm. And if we're given antibiotics, what do you expect? So, imagine feeding your puppy antibiotics so you can eat it for Thanksgiving. Isn't that what we're doing? Fatten it up quicker? In America, you can kill bacteria. You can have them kill you. You can use drugs that kill you. You can have as many guns as you want that are designed to kill you. You can kill an unborn child, but you can't legally kill yourself if you're suffering from a painful, debilitating illness that will eventually kill you. How crazy is that? I made that up. I thought it was quite clever. You know? I thought it was amazing. We prescribe long-term low-dose antibiotics to kill bacteria in the bladder. So to prevent a bladder infection, we give an antibiotic every day for a year, up to five years in kids, sometimes five years. And we wonder why the treatment drives the pathogens inside the cells to persist and then re-emerge to cause more serious infections and disorders. We feed antibiotics to animals to make them obese, feed them to children, helping them become obese, Yet those researchers in France want to ban probiotics because they think they're to blame for obesity. They're not to blame for obesity. How crazy is that? Alanis Morissette, Canada, isn't it ironic? Is there something wrong with our societal model? I mean, this is a talk on microbiome, but this is, this is a societal question. Have we learned from tobacco? I don't think we have. This came out very recently week ago, two weeks, stop killing the beneficial bacteria, Martin Blazer. So can antibiotics change the microbiome? Well, administration at weaning of subtherapeutic antibiotics, or no antibiotic drinking water, increased adiposity in young mice and increased hormone. This is from Nature 2012, you've probably seen it. So it's changing the microbiome. It's changing the metabolome. And yet we're giving it out almost like confetti. And the places where you think they would have learned, like Holland, who are pro pro progressive, it's increasing. There'll never be a better time to look back and move forward. Centuries, people have used natural substances. The early Chinese, Indians, Egyptians all used various natural remedies to treat wounds. We didn't know the exact component. We need to go back and look at that. Adopting other methods of maintaining animal health, comfort, and well-being can reduce drug use and costs. For example, if you stop overcrowding, if you control heat stress, provide vaccination, use beneficial microbes. I'm learning from Europe. This is Europe on reducing antibiotic use in livestock. They reduced it from an average of 45 tons to 15 tons. This is just Sweden. And Danish farmers increased swine production by 47%. Europe's shown it can happen. We're in Europe. North America hasn't learned this lesson. So along comes the microbiome. And at this conference, you're going to hear, I think, amazing science presented by world-class scientists. And when you, when you listen, and when you look at the posters, ask yourself, why do we as a society put up with this crap? We're too silent. We really are far too silent. There's millions of infants born healthy in numerous developing countries that will die because of diarrheal diseases that probiotics might have prevented or helped treat. In America, number one. And if you want to talk about, to anyone that's passionate about that, see Dan Merenstein, who's at this event. Remind me, what's the definition of public health? Which public does it exclude? 
And is the public aware of the disparities? We're not doing anything about this. Why? In developed countries like the US, premature infants get very sick and die from necrotizing enterocolitis when the same child in Australia would have been given proborics and might likely not even become sick. Now who's really sick? Cramped in the US and Europe by a regulatory system that approved drugs for dubious efficacy, sometimes lethal side effects, debt burdening prices, they box beneficial microbes into a corner like a misbehaving child, while politicians too worried about votes to attempt to understand science allow, uh, ignore the common sense of countries like Australia. EFSA, the king canoe of regulatory bodies. <laughs> is EFSA's head in the sand? This is Alliance for Natural Health. People kind of laugh this off. We should be in the streets protesting. Not only banning any health claim for probate, banning the word for crying out loud. Banning the word. Let's ban Manchester. <laughs> Why not? Liverpool, the hell with it. If you want to use Activia yogurt to prevent, treat, or cure a disease in the US, you need to register it as a drug and then get a prescription. Hello? It's because the laws they set up in 1938 were that you can't have a food that treats, prevents disease. What kind of stupid law is that? We haven't learned anything since 1938? God. How is FDN and EFSA going to cope with the acres of new published evidence? How are they going to cope with new organisms like Fecalobacterium, Acromancia? It's not that there's no science there. This is from Colin Hill and others uh, in Ireland. Salivarius bacteriosin protects mice against listeria. John McCormick shown uh, lactobacilli produces cyclic dipeptides against toxic shock staph. Staphylococci, the, the bug, the super bug that's killing people. Wait a minute, why don't we use lactobacilli? Oh, we can't use that, it's a live bacteria. We can't use it again, it's a probiotic. Oh my God, don't say the word. Characterization is screening in novel bacteriosins from lactic acid bacteria. Antibiotics are signaling molecules. Aye, signaling. We need to signal some of the idiots that are out there. More than signal. Sorry. This is a study we did on bacterial vaginosis. On the left-hand side, this is the, the profile of one person. The blue is a lactobacilli. The red is Gardnerella. This is their vaginal profile. So you can see all these people have bacterial vaginosis. And after this, most of them again have bacterial vaginosis. And the cure rate with antibiotics was 50%. We gave them metronidazole plus placebo. Here we gave them metronidazole plus lactobacilli, and guess what? The cure rate went up and the lactobacilli came back. Why don't we think about giving them both a standard practice? Even in Britain, uh, my colleague, Sir Harry Burns, a friend of mine, he, um, he's the chief medical officer for health in Scotland, he went and he got an antibiotic, and the doctor said, you should take a probiotic, and he's like, what? Finally, people are listening. Are you ready for a world without antibiotics? This is an interesting question from The Guardian, one of the top science journals in England. So what are they doing? They're looking at the bottom of the ocean for them. This is the, the next thing. I guess that's because a camera can take you far down to the ocean now. But. So researchers continue to look for new antibiotics at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe practitioners should consider how they use the current agents and what alternatives might work before people drown in the meantime, looking for the new agents. <laughs> so the Journal of New, new England Journal of Medicine, this is their take on the future of antibiotics. So they said, prevent infection and resistance. So use automated disinfection of hospitals. I presume that's walls, clean, everything. Get rid of catheters and prostheses. Well, that's easy. So just let people pee on the bed? Like, wh what do they mean? Reduce admissions to hospital. Let's <laughs> keep them outside. No, I'm sorry, I know you're sick. <laughs> You're not coming in. That's the solution. This is public health. Good. Governments defray R&D costs and have faster approvals for drugs. OK, so the, the pharmaceutical companies have screwed up for years. They overcharge in drugs. But let's give them a break so they can make more drugs. No. Let's change the system. Preserve current antibiotics. Well, that's good. They degrade in waste. 
we should probably do better diagnosis of therapy. Nobody suggested in this course, well, it was written by MDs, maybe we should look at probiotics and, and antibiotics. Immune-based therapies attack the virulence without killing the pathogens. Uh, not a bad idea, but a bit hairy-fairy to me. Probiotics weren't mentioned. And then they actually did say probiotics to compete for microbial growth. Why only growth? I like putting them in a little box like this. They like little boxes. Remember, microbes are going to be the last survivors on future Earth. Now, it's a long time away. It's billions of years from now, and only Glenn will be alive, but I mean, still, <laughs> they're going to outlast us. So we have to learn to live with them. We have to use antibiotics the right way when we need them, when people are going to die otherwise, not to fatten up the things we're going to eat. So the consequence of killing, we're going back to Shakespeare, I thought being near Cambridge, probably, I think he was Scottish too though, wasn't he? <laughs> After killing Duncan, Macbeth had to make sure nobody founds out, so he kills Banco. That leads to enormous guilt, his wife's guilt, killing Lady Macduff, madness, and his own murder. That's what will happen. Innocent bacteria die, but not all bacteria die. Bacteria fight back, so they would. And the host dies. Is that what we want? That's the path we're going. We need to learn life is connected. All life is connected, genetically, through evolution, utilizing nutrients, gases of the planet, the unified energy field, however you see life. We're all connected. I think the talks you're going to hear at this meeting will tell you about that connectedness, how bacteria influence an awful lot of who we are and what we do. That's the excitement of this conference and the people that are here to present. So which bacteria did you help today? Thank you. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Gregor. Um, can we have some questions from the floor, please? Rather than questions, I'd like to hear people getting passionate about this area. I'd like people to stand up and say, I agree, or, or we should be doing something. Or you disagree. And if you disagree, then don't come forward. <laughs> you have to come. You have to use the microphone. What? Because the while, recording. Yeah, OK. Are you going to go? Gregor, what, what do you think people should be doing more, in your view? What you, OK. So, um, in Argentina, when the, uh, the government of Argentina started to significantly cut back on research dollars. They had over 100,000 scientists, technicians, march through the street of Buenos Aires, banging these frying pans. And they had little badges made up with uh, frying pans. I don't know if you've ever seen them. But they stood up. They finally said, you know, this is enough. And if, uh, at this conference, I tried to get Annie Lennox to come and speak at dinner tonight. And we got through to her agent. She couldn't make it. And the reason I wanted Annie Lennox is, what do you think the AIDS community did? They said, we're not taking this. They stood up and fought for their disease, their passion, whatever. If we don't stand up for this, who is going to stand up? Really, there is so much wrong. So I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it's demonstrations. I don't know if it's lobbying MPs. But as a scientist, this is unacceptable. And the current practice of physicians in some cases, is almost malpractice. And we need to educate them, and they need to be engaged in the process. Because at the end of the day, they have to deliver, because the system we've set up, they have to deliver the healthcare. And we have to help them deliver alternatives to what they're doing. Because the pressure's on them. They have, I'm not suggesting I'm criticizing all physicians. It's a tough job. But what's happening is nuts. So I, I, I wish I knew the answer. Um, but I, you know, I don't think we speak out enough. We're really sitting quite passively. And industry is just as much to blame. Why industry hasn't been banging on the doors of EFSA is beyond me. Instead of that, they're just accepting what's happening. Question. I'm uh, Jim Geddert from the National Cancer Institute at NIH. Um, thank you for that uh, very entertaining and provocative talk. Um, much food for thought and many angles to take. Uh, so the AIDS activists uh, attacked on many fronts, and some of them were 
lobbying for the development of additional new drugs. Uh, and I think the most productive was probably the lobbying for uh, clinical trials of those drugs to help sort out uh, efficacy and safety on things that would actually help people. I wonder if you could comment on the obstacles to uh, clinical trials for probiotics. Because uh, right now, I think just you know, rummaging about in the dark uh, won't get us where we want to go. Yeah, so um, I can first of all speak to America. So the problem in America is the FDA has said if you're going to do a clinical trial, even with a food that is going to uh, treat, prevent, or cure a disease, you have to register as a drug. So we have cases of uh, Pat Hibbard, who has had NIH grants, ethics approval at local Harvard Medical School, Everything's approved, and FDA says, no, you cannot do this study because you're treating and preventing disease with a food. You have to register that as a drug. Well, anyone that's registered a drug, not only is it very expensive, but it's a huge process. So she's been waiting five years. No one has talked about the kids that probably have died because they haven't had that intervention. So that process, to me, is absolutely ludicrous. Who's speaking out about that? I mean... It's not, I'm, I'm not saying I support everything the AIDS activists did, but what, what happened was they got together and said, we're not going to take it. And unfortunately, there's no one in either probiotics or nutrition science or even, I study bacterial vaginosis, women's health. I mean, bacterial vaginosis and urinary tract infection affect every woman at some point in their life. They don't have a group that goes out and lobbies or supports them. So there's no voice. So how do you fight it? And it has to be at different levels. And so clinical trials in the States is a big problem. Now in Canada, you can go through Health Canada and they'll, give you, they'll allow you to do studies like that. I don't know what it's like in Europe. So that's first of all. Second thing is the technology has been pushed by dairy companies and, and food companies. And the margins are much, much less. So they don't, in general, have a lot of money. And it's sad because the, the two big companies, Nestle and Danon, who do have had some resources, they're cut back their R&D because of EFSA. There's next to nothing happening that I've seen that's exciting doing big trials. So the only pl place left is the government. Uh, NIH, uh, Medical Research Council, Canada. You, I don't know, Karen Madsen's here. You try and get a clinical trial on probiotics done with, say, comparing three strains of probiotics in Canada. Nobody's going to fund that. Who's going to fund that? So, and, and then in the States, they might say, well, we're not going to fund that because you're still going after a disease. You have to do a drug trial. So they've made the, the system so complicated that it's hard to do clinical trials. But there's some being done, and uh, you know, I think there's going to be more data will come out. But 